Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our second day of our Common Ground Passage to Strength and Change. If you joined us yesterday, it was a wonderful day. And by the way, I'm, I'm Nancy Easterling. It is my honor to serve as the Executive Director here at Historic Soderley. As Jeannie mentioned, we're going live, so we have people joining us virtually. In fact, there are many people who were here yesterday that I think went virtual this today. So uh, welcome if you're joining virtually. If it's your first time on the platform, there is a chat function. Sign in and let us know where you're joining us from today. And that's where you're also, there's a question and answer um, tab that's on there. Please just use that when you are going to be asking questions later because Jerome is ready for lots of questions today. I know he is, he's excited. I want to thank our sponsors today, the Maryland Humanities and the Maryland Heritage Area Authority. They have long believed in the work we're doing. And we also have Whiteford Systems, who is making all the magic possible. Thank you, Andrew, in the back for helping us today as one of our sponsors. As Jeannie uh, mentioned earlier to the crowd that was here, a part of the grant for, that we had this year was to create a video. We're really excited. You're going to see people taping today. We have Focus Video, who has been an incredible supporter of us for so many years, working with one of our former trustees whose vision is amazing, Meredith Taylor, who's trying to hide in the back. But Meredith, thank you so much. Meredith and Focus Video are going to create a wonderful video for us to use about our Common Ground program, about our descendants, about the work we're doing. And it's going to be aired on August the 20th when we have our UNESCO Day of Commemoration. Gwen Bankins, our secretary of the board, who you heard yesterday and the head of our PRI committee, is really taking charge of this event. It is going to be amazing. I am just telling you right now, mark your calendars. Join us for August the 20th. So yesterday, you were able to hear two wonderful speakers. And if you missed any of it, do not worry. We're going to have this virtually and um, available for you to watch. In the morning, you heard from some of our descendants. And Trudy, you do get the prize for coming the farthest. In case you did not realize, Trudy Taliaferro came all the way from Sacramento, California to be with us for this event. So Trudy, thank you so much. Oh my gosh. You will see her as one of the people interviewed on the film in August as well. Trudy, thank you so much. But all the panelists were wonderful. They gave us their, their voice, their history, their stories, their perspectives. That is truly the strength of Sauterly right now, the fact that our descendants are such an incredible part of the work that we're doing as we move forward. And they're making us better and stronger for their participation and their leadership. And it was a wonderful panel. In the afternoon, you got to see Shamika um, Renee, who did a wonderful living history performance, but also shared her perspectives not only in character, but then as somebody who does living history and sometimes portrays difficult uh, characters, ones uh, who are in difficult and hurtful situations, how does that affect you? How, how are you able to portray somebody who was enslaved? She's had that question many times and her, the grace with which she handles it because she said they need a voice. Today, you're going to get to see one of our panelists come back as a command performance. He was able to uh, be one of our presenters last January, January 6th, I think it was, of last year. Kicked the year off wonderfully with our virtual performance uh, for our series. And let me read you a little bit about our wonderful speaker today, Jerome Spears. It's in your, it's in your packet, but you have probably haven't had time to look at it, so I'll just read it to you now. Jerome Spears is a native of Baltimore, Maryland. He accelerated his genealogical research efforts back in 2009. He attended Morgan State University and received his undergraduate degree from the University of Hawaii. Go Rainbows. We both graduated from the University of Hawaii. It's how we first bonded. <laughs> and geography, that's what he graduated from, and has served um, has served him well in assisting his approach to meticulously positioning his ancestors within the historical context of place to uncover and reveal remarkable and amazing family history discoveries. 
as a GU-272 Susquehanna Plantation and historic historically plantation descendant. His regional focus continues to be nested in the DMV and compelling links to North Carolina, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Louisiana, Alabama, the UK, Ireland, Australia, and the African countries of Nigeria, Ghana, Sierra Leone, Senegal, Angola, and the Congo. Spears is a retired 30-year U.S. Army veteran who over that same period experienced some levels of success as a musician and record producer, as well as a professional boxing comp uh, a commentator. We're going to get you back for the music someday. I'm, I'm just saying that's going to happen. And, and, you know, as I read the list of all the places he is connected to, you know, when our, the name of this is Common Ground. I mean, look at how many connections that Jerome has. And are you connected to Jerome? I don't know. You just might be because he's connected to all over. Jerome, it's a pleasure to welcome you. Let me turn the mic over to Jerome Spears. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Nancy. You. Okay, this is great. So I'm going to start by asking a, a question. Thank you, for everyone, for coming this morning. And I'll kick off this by asking, how many of you all have living siblings, three, four, five or more? Any hands here? Okay. Any hands in TV land? Um, okay, so that's a good data point. Multiple siblings, and you may or may not have tested them, but I'm, I'm just trying to gather myself here. Uh, how many of you all have taken a DNA test? Okay, got a few hands here and there. Anybody taking the test with multiple companies, right? We've got all those different companies that are out today. So just a couple of hands here. Okay, so uh, what we're gonna do is talk about DNA. Normally when you start to do something like this, you know, you're doing a presentation, they'll go, okay, Spears, we'll give you 15 minutes. Oh, well, we'll give, you, we'll give you a half hour. You know, sometimes if you're lucky, 40 minutes, but that's top. That's all I'm gonna give you, 40 minutes. But when you have a workshop, you have a little, opportunity to kind of really get into the weeds and kick the tires and explain some of this stuff. So if, if we have some seasoned ringers in the audience that are veterans and you know everything there is, you know how to spell DNA backwards and forwards, that's great. If you've never even seen the term before, we hopefully will touch on enough stuff so that by the time we're done, DNA, okay, I got it. You know, we'll, we'll be able to carry, carry you from that perspective as well. Um, some of these slides are going to be wonky. Some of them are going to be technical. Some of them are going to be in the weeds. And some of them are going to be, I think, pretty clear where you can kind of go with me. But between the slides and me talking, if I don't stay on the slide that long, forgive me. If I go too fast, forgive me. But we're going to try to have a nice, even pace so that I'm going to bring everybody along in a nice way. Um, and uh, with that, I guess I'm going to get started. Um, Okay. Oh, there I am right there. Okay. So cornerstone of discovery. Uh, well, let me do this. So we talk about DNA. DNA is all over the world. It's all over the world. It might be on other planets for all we know, but at least we know on planet Earth. I mean, if we dig far enough back, we may all be connected in some kind of way. And um, depending on your experience and what you're able to discover, um, We've taken some, some steps to try to get to the point where we can literally start to piece some of these pieces back together again. And some of these, these broken pieces have come about for different reasons. But um, so we're going to try to cover some of these stuff, some of these things today. And uh, I'll try to stop and slow down and explain terms um, from time to time. And maybe in some instances, I won't explain the term. But if you see something that I, I ran over real fast and you want me to circle back to it, just let me know and you know, I'll try to re remember and we'll try to get back to it. Okay, so I'm not gonna list them out, but you can see those things. Uh, number five, uh, MRCA, most recent common ancestor. Is that acronym and everything else I think we'll be good with. Okay, so I'm gonna start with my dad. Okay, everybody's got one. Everybody had one. And uh, so there's dad. And then I'm going to go from dad to mom. 
Everyone's had one of those two. Okay, so we're, we're cooking with gas so far. So that was Spears and Jordan in terms of the, the surnames. And then I'm going to go to this wonky slide, the chromosomes. This is a company out called 23andMe. And I think they ought to be called 46 and we. Now, of course, they'll, they'll probably never take my advice. But why do I say that? They're talking about 23 chromosomes, 23 chromosome pairs, one, one pair for mom, one pair for dad. So when you're thinking about the DNA and these chromosomes, if you just think, if you just have 23 in your head, stuff's going to get past you. Because if you go to Ancestry, for example, and Ancestry says, you've got a 20 centimorgan match on one segment. And a centimorgan is a measure of how much DNA you have relative to another person, which, which you can use to relate one to the other. So if Ancestry says, you've got a 20 centimorgan match on one segment, well, I'm going to scratch my head and say, Okay, which segment? Oh, you want to know which segment? Oh, yeah, that would, that would help me, Ancestry. Which segment? Well, you can go to someplace else to get that. And so, suppose I go someplace else and I find that the segment is located on chromosome eight. So now, okay, one segment, chromosome eight. But I'm going to scratch my head again and ask another question which side? Oh, now you want to know which side? Well, what do you, why do you need to know that? I've told you chromosome, one segment chromosome eight. Why do you need to know which side? Because if it's chromosome eight on my dad's side, that's Spears. If it's chromosome eight on my mom's side, that's Jordan. So that's two different hemispheres all happening on that same chromosome. So I really want to know which chromosome, which side. Once I know that, then I want to know, okay, from the, from the left to the right, what's the address? If you think about these chromosomes having addresses. And so the far left would be an address that's whatever it is. And then in the middle, you'd have a middle address. And then on the far right, you'd have a far right address. So I want to know the address. I want to know the chromosome number. I want to know the amount of centimorgans. I want to know whether it's paternal or maternal. And I want to know what's the address. If you get me to that spot, I might be dangerous. I might be able to connect some dots because there might be somebody else that goes, well, I was looking at my results and I'm on chromosome eight on the maternal side, right in the middle. I says, oh, we got to talk. Now we, got to, we have something to talk about. But you've got to be able to get to that point. So, so for the companies that just tell you, one segment, 20 centimorgans, have a nice day. There's a lot more that one can get out of this stuff. So what does that mean? That means you want to test in all of the different companies if you can. And in some cases, if you spend the money to test with one company, they allow for you to get your raw DNA out of that company that you test it with, park it on your computer, then go to some of the other testing companies and, and all of them are competing for your, for your business. And so they would welcome you taking that raw DNA out of the company you paid to get your test done with, bringing it into, ingesting it into their system. And they won't charge you for that. They just want to get you in the game on their side of the fence. Some of the tools that they have in their environment might be somewhat different, not better or worse, somewhat different than the environment uh, relative to the tools you had in the original packet that you paid for. And so now you can get into that second or third or fourth environment. And while they won't charge you to get in entry level, they'll give you some access, they'll give you some capability. And what they really want to do is put a shiny object in front of you and go, yeah, but if you give us $10 a month, we'll let you see this. So that's fine. That's, that's, that's the marketing plan. And they, they, they're, they're not in this for free. They want to make money too. So they want to lure you in, get you in some of these other platforms. But, but where you can take advantage of this is get in on the ground floor on all of them. And maybe some of those shiny objects will be compelling enough when next thing you know, let me come up with 10 bucks here. That's pretty good. You might end up biting on one or two. 
but maybe not on all of them. But you're in all of them. And in all of those environments, you might be able to pick up little bits and pieces that one shows you that the other one didn't. And so it just helps you to be more more universal because you're swimming in multiple lakes in that way. And you're 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 leveraging the strengths of all of the various companies in that way. OK, so that's a little bit about these 23 or like I like to say 46 chromosomes, because if you've got a pair that you've gotten from mom and a pair that you've gotten from dad, 23 and 23 is 46. OK, but I guess the advertising people said, oh, let's just stick. 23 of me has a nice ring to it. Let's stick with that. OK, so with regard to the chromosomes, we talked about how you get 50 percent of your DNA from mom, 50 percent from dad. Open and shut. Nobody debates that. It's, it's a pretty definitive statement that you can say and keep a straight face. Um, and so blue, I use blue for paternal, pink or red for maternal. 50 percent, you know, again, n- nothing, nothing to, to struggle with there. And so this is just representing one chromosome from the last slide showing you all 22 or 23. Mom and dad, dad on top, mom on the bottom. OK. So this is another way to do the same thing. So I, I kicked off by asking you some of you and got some answers from some of you about how many of you had three, four or five siblings. And we got some we got some responses from that. Why do I ask that? Because I've got four siblings, which means where are the spears five and um, these five siblings have all tested. Now, what's the good news about having all five of these folks in the game? Didn't test mom before she passed. Dad passed when I was real, real, real young. Didn't have a shot testing him at all. And so but the DNA that's in the siblings particularly multiple siblings that come, your parents gave you a dose, a distribution, a slice, an inheritance, a part of them. And in each instance, there's some overlap. There's some duplication, but also in each, in each instance, there's some uniqueness that some of the siblings are getting that some of the other siblings aren't. So if you can come up with three, four, five, six, eight siblings, get all those siblings tested, put all of them into the game. Now, now you're working with something because something that I might have in my results for mom and dad, I can then add to the things that my brother has for mom and dad that I don't have. And the things that my sister got for mom and dad that we don't have. And before you know it collectively, if there are mechanisms or, or, or processes where I can put this all together. I can see mom and dad's DNA. I can reverse engineer the DNA of the five siblings funneling back up and it all circles back to mom and dad's DNA and this processes that allow you to kind of do that. So that's why I asked anybody who has multiple siblings, the things you can do to get you way further down the road than somebody that it doesn't have three, four or five siblings. Now, if you're the family historian, the family genealogist, and your only child, or it's just you and one other sibling, but you've got a cousin, it's got a big family, seven or eight siblings. They're your first cousin, which means what? The brother of your mother has all those kids. Okay, you didn't get all the kids, but your mother's brother did. So go to go talk to them. Get those six or seven siblings to get in the game. So, it's, you know, because now if you do that and get that those cousins in the game and, and use all that collective DNA that those six or seven cousins have, they can start working their way back up the generations on their side of the fence. But because they're cousins of yours, it's not going to take too long before all of their people are your people because you're cousins. There's going to be a relation, right? That's going to happen a few generations back. And now you're living vicariously off of these cousins. Their discoveries become your discoveries because at some point you're hitting the same people that apply for you, even though you only have one or two siblings and and not as much firepower to throw at this thing. Okay, so having the Spears Five in the game is a good thing. Um, Dealing with the fact that up and down the chromosomes, 
uh, we've got this 50% thing that's going on between mom and dad, giving each of us 50%. Now, the thumbprint or fingerprint that I have here, I, I use that not to say that, that uh, you know, I fingerprinted my siblings or anything like that. It's, it's just to say that just like the, your, your fingerprint or your thumbprint is unique to each of you, even your siblings. If I put my fingerprint someplace and my brother puts his fingerprint someplace, you know, the G-men can come along and discern which one was my brother and which one was me because that's a unique thing. And so these chromosomes are going to be the same way. They're going to be similar, but there's going to be enough uniqueness embedded within so that you're going to be able to tell Nason's DNA on chromosome four from my DNA on chromosome four. Now, if he and I were identical twins, maybe from end to end, those chromosomes would be almost uh, indiscernible, perhaps, um, if we were identical twins. But we're not. And unless you have a case where you have identical twins, all this DNA, even among siblings, is going to be different enough where you want to capitalize and exploit those differences. So if we're getting 50 percent for mom and dad, um, what is what is what was what is dad doing? Dad must have gotten 50 percent from his parents. OK, so if dad got 50 percent from his parents. OK, well, we're kind of on a roll here. So my dad, father was Spears, his mother was Gant, St. Mary's County, Calvert County. OK, we're on a roll here. What about my mom? Well, my mom got 50% from, from her parents. The Jordans from Valley Lee, the Stevens and Bankins from right here in Hollywood. Okay, so 50% on my mom's side. Um, it's good stuff. And, and, and that would be the profile that my mother and my father would have. But we're not, talk, we're not talking about my mother and my father, we're talking about me and my siblings. So if, if I've got uh, if I've got 50% from my mom and my dad, then we could stand, it would stand a reason that when we go to the next level, I probably have 25% from those four grandparents. We're just doing the math. But DNA doesn't work like that. Wouldn't it be great if it was that easy? Doesn't work that like that. It's not quite that simple. Um, so you would suspect that if I'm getting 50% from dad, 50% from mom, I go back one generation. Okay, 25% from the from the grandparents, we're good to go. Doesn't, doesn't work that way. Clarissa's going to like this next slide. And why is that the case? Because there's something called recombination, genetic recombination. So what does that mean? At the grandparent level, they're not playing nice. It's a knife fight. <laughs> They're struggling to give their inheritance to you. And they're not being pleasant about it. Grandmom, she, my, my grandmother was, my grandmother was about four feet, whatever. And my grandfather was six, oh, six, five. But guess what? In the DNA battle, she could pull her weight. She punched above her weight. And so, and that's the nature of how this works for DNA. Recombinate genetic recombination is at play for all of us. So that by the time you get to the grandparent level, Grandma Gant and Grandma and Grandpa Spears, they're at it tooth and nail. They're fighting. They're pulling that rope. They're struggling. Why? Because it's it's almost like the the the, the nature of I want I want my family's DNA to survive. No, I want my family's DNA to survive. And it's at that level where this this pleasant but violent struggle takes place for your inheritance, genetic recombination. And it doesn't happen just every now and then. It's happening all up and down the 23 chromosomes. This battle, this violent struggle, this tug of war. It's awesome what these, what these grandparents are doing. And they were so nice and pleasant, but who would have thought that Behind the scenes, just pulling back and forth. Okay, so so we talked a little bit about this. So in this scenario, each of these chromosomes, this is chromosome four example. In this example, halfway part 
Switch the grandma on the paternal side. Halfway spot, switch the grandma on the maternal side. So that each each of these uh, folks would be given a nice, even, cooperative 25% each. That'd be great if it worked that way, right? For any given chromosome, it would be great if that's how it worked. But because of genetic recombination, I'm going to show you my chromosome lay down. This is the actual lay down for some of my chromosomes. Not all 23 of them couldn't fit them on the slide easily, but you're seeing examples of how some of this looks. And so there's a process that we can use called visual phasing that allows us to be able to go into the raw data, load that data into a company called JetMatch and use some of the processes in, in JetMatch along with a lot of cousins, your siblings, and, and a few other things to get to the point where you can actually see your DNA as it really came to you from those grandparents. So you're actually able to see the fight. You're actually able to see how the struggle was resolved, chromosome by chromosome. So, so why, is, why is that important? I'll, I'll, do it, I'll do it here. So look at chromosome 16. Grand, grand Pop Spears on chromosome 16, he took a look at Grandmom Gant and said, <laughs> he yanked that rope so hard, he took all the oxygen out of the room. Didn't let Grandma Gant get in sideways. So on, cram, on, on, on chromosome 16, I have no Gant DNA at all. How dare Grand Pop Spears do that to Grandma Gant? Don't worry, don't feel bad for Grandma Gant. Look what she did to Grandpa Spears on chromosome 17. <laughs> she ripped it right back. And now on Grand on 17, he has no DNA represented in me that I got. And Graham, uh, Grandpa Jordan did the same thing to Grandma Stevens and, and Bankins on chromosome 17 as well. So this is why to get to this point where you can see this stuff. To be able to see this, you can do things when you can see this. In the absence of being able to see it, you're just thinking, oh, I get 25% from my grandparents. Well, it depends on which chromosome. On this chromosome, I didn't get any DNA from Gantt. On this chromosome, I didn't get any DNA from Spears. And so for me to know that is very important. You've got folks that are out here that will go, you'll say something like, oh, I think I'm this or I think I'm that. And the person will look back at you and say, okay, where do you think that's happening? Oh, chromosome 17. Well, let's look at 17. You think you got some? Oh, no, 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 you don't have a hit on 17. It's not true. It's not true. You, I don't see anything on 17. Somebody told you, sold you a bill of goods. You don't have anything on 17. Well, if what we were looking for was a Spears answer on 17, I didn't get Spears DNA there. So... So my brother, my brother may have, my sister may have, right? So all of a sudden you go, well, how come I'm matching Charlie on 17 and, and my sister's not? Or the other way around. Genetic recombination. Genetic recombination. It's a big deal. It's something we need to put in the vocabulary. Let's see what I have here on the next one here. Okay, so this is just talking about visual phasing. Um, explains it. It defines it. It's, it's the process where you're using the, the, the DNA of three, four, or five siblings and multiple cousins, multiple cousins, some on dad's side, some on mom's side, hopefully second cousins, third cousins, however many you can get. So while I'm running around telling everybody under the sun, anybody that I can talk to, please, please, just get your DNA in the game. Get your DNA. I, I need more DNA in the game. I can always use more DNA in the game because... Each of our DNA is like that fingerprint. It's unique and it's going to reveal and show things that maybe somebody else's doesn't show. So your DNA might be containing the magical nugget of information that's going to help me solve something that goes back 100 years. That's why I want you in the game. Um, OK, so but let's play around with this. Let's play around with this a little bit. OK, so I'm isolating chromosome nine. You can see my various 
chromosomes that I'm showing you in display here. And I'm, I'm isolating chromosome nine. In the aggregate, that's about 25%, right? Spears, Gantt, about halfway mark, 25%. Now, if you look real close, you might think, oh, Spears is a little more, but we're not gonna, we're not gonna worry about that. Let's just call it for the sake of discussion, 25%. Look at Bankins and, and Jordan. It's, it's, it's recombinating more than the spears Gantt recombination. That only had one recombination across the whole chromosome, and, Spe and Jordan and Bankins had cerebral. But in the aggregate, if you kind of line up all the Jordan and all the Bankins, it's about half and half. So in, in my chromosome nine, I literally got what people think about DNA doctrinally. I literally got about that split on chromosome nine, about 25% from each grandparent. If I look at, look at chromosome six, grandma Rankins got all of the DNA on the maternal side. Look at chromosome 11, grandpa Spears got all of the chromosome on chromosome 11. We already talked about 17, where Jordan and Gant each get all of the chromosome. And then at the bottom here, grandpa, uh, grandma Stevens and Rankins got all of the DNA for me on chromosome 21. And so this thing is dynamic. It's floating, it's moving around, it's a moving target. And unless you can get to the point where you can freeze frame, get a, get a, a, a snapshot of what this thing is doing. And, 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 and then, then once you have it, you have it. Cause I'm, I'm here, I'm not going anywhere. This stuff that's in me, that's, that's what, I, this is my package for the duration. Once you figure it out, now you've got a stat, now you've got a piece of data that you can work with, that you can hang on to. Okay, so we talk about theoretically 25%, but the reality is it can really be anywhere from 50% to zero, to 25, 25, to any variation in between. So that's 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 something that's takes, you know, interesting processing. So, um, didn't want to do that. Okay, so we, we talked about that 25, 25, and then all the other chromosomes. So I've gone through, and it took me over a year to do this visual phasing process because uh, while there are some people that have figured out ways to automate portions of it, it's still a labor-intensive and very uh, tedious process to actually do that. So you say, well, is this, is this uh, juice worth the squeeze? Why, why would I sit there for a year to create these, these 23 snapshots. Well, hopefully before we're done, you, you'll have some appreciation for why there's some value in doing this. So here, here's the, the, the actual the math on what my percentages are. So just from memory, if you remember chromosome 21, I think it was, where's 21? 20 was, was a complete wipeout. Bankins, Bank and Stevens had 50% and uh, Jordan had zero. It looks like in 20, in 20, the same thing happened where Bankins had 50%, Jordan had zero, and then chromosome 11, Spears had 50%, and Gantt had, uh, had zero. And then you have a few others that 20, 25, 25, 30, 20, 40, 10. You know, you're going to have that dynamic range going back and forth, which means on certain chromosomes, you may have a lot of a certain surname DNA, on other chromosomes, you may not have any. And if you don't know this answer, then you know, you're in the game with only some of the information that might help you get where you're trying to go. So this is just a cleaned up Excel file version of, uh, of that same nugget of information. So what do, we, what do we do? We go from the theoretical, 50% from the parents, 25 uh, to the grandparents, to me now knowing my actual numbers. And in, these are my actual numbers. So I went, through, I went through over a year, came up with all this stuff, and what do I come up with? It's about 25%. I mean, if you wanna just shrug your shoulders and, and you know, round to the nearest whatever, it's pretty close, but that's, that's how it works doctrinally. In theory, that's how it works. But the magic isn't just knowing the percentages because I'm a little bit more Gantt than I am Spears. I'm a little bit more Stevens and Bankins than I am Mason and Jordan, numerically. 
But the real magic above and beyond just knowing those numbers is to know where these distributions are happening, to know where these placements are across these 46 chromosomes on the maternal or the paternal side, because I want to match with somebody and I want to see if there's a connection and I want to know where I'm running out of real estate on a certain chromosome surname and where a recombination has taken place and leaked to another grandparent. And that may be why my brother's hitting somebody, but I'm not. So it's just a way to think about what's really going on behind the curtain with this stuff. So hopefully people are kind of tracking where I'm, where I'm trying to go with this. So, so when we say we've got 50% for mom and dad, that's great. But above and beyond just knowing 50%, I don't even have to do a chart to know that answer. But I'd rather visual phase the DNA and be able to see in and out along these chromosomes where I'm shifting from one to the next on paternal or maternal, because now I can go out and do some research and I'll know certain things because I can see, I can see things. It's like being able to see 3D as opposed to just being able to see straight ahead. Okay, so I'm gonna skip through a couple more of these. Let's see what we got. So it's not really that, it's that. Uh, now the other thing, so once I get to the point where I'm looking at a chromosome and I can see that on chromosome seven, I'm hitting a particular snippet of DNA. Well, these grandparents, I like to call them the Fantastic Four, any of you Marvel comic book uh, characters. My Fantastic Four, I think we all have a Fantastic Four. That's what the grandparents are because they each, they each provide you, the grandchild, entree into their world. Behind them is all the DNA that goes back to forever that emanated in them that they gave to their parents that the parents gave to you. So if you can get to the point where you know, I want to go behind door number four to look for something, or I want to go behind door number two to search for my Gantz from Calvert County, or I want to go behind door number one to track down my father's people. So once you get into those chromosomes, and once you know chromosome 12, halfway down, father's side, right there, that's, that's DNA that just belongs to you, given to you by your dad, going through number one. So that means I can eliminate querying three-fourths of my, of my tree because the DNA in that particular instance has got to be one of these people back here because of the placement of the DNA. It's got to be behind door number one in that example. So another, another technique I have here, auto, auto clustering, and a lot of this stuff is in JetMatch. I think I made reference to JetMatch. Um, a lot of the stuff is in JetMatch. Here's another automated tool that you can get to out of JetMatch. Joseph Parham, my first cousin on my mother's side. He's my mother's, uh, he's my, uh, my aunt's oldest son. He and I were born a few months apart from each other. So I know jo Joseph, he's a Bankins and the Jordan on the maternal side. On the paternal side, he's a parm, and I can't remember what his father's mother's name was, but he's a parm and something else on his father's side. So I'm just focusing in on the mother's side because that's the side from a DNA perspective that's going to relate most to me. So if I do some, let the uh, JetMatch and some of these high-speed uh, programs do their clustering, they can go out and look at 10,000 names that are in these huge databases where DNA is. And they can look at and, and compare and contrast and say, OK, we think we see some things here. And all of a sudden they go whoop and create these these clusters, these packets where they're saying Joseph has some similarity with all of these people in some kind of way. All right. So and so they color code them and cluster them. And so I can see names like Halliburton and Jordan and uh, Altobusen. And these are all these, these are names I know. These are Jordan names. Now, there might be other names or sometimes people go on on, on the sites and they, they put the name down. Um, we they just use initials or something. So KT or 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 here's Jackie with just a first name. So I don't know who all these people are. But the system has told me they're all clustering around a common ancestor. And because I know enough of the names, I know that this packet 
This cluster is a Jordan packet. If I come down to this one, by halfway down, I see the name of uh, Gwendolyn Bankins. Oh, Gwendolyn Bankins. I wonder, I wonder what that pack, I wonder what that cluster belongs to. So I don't have to know the rest of the names. I find one or two names that I know, and that then tells me the computer has already gone in and done the number crunching and seen matching segments on enough chromosomes to tell me, hey, Spears, look at this person, Trinity so-and-so, or this person, Janice. If you're hunting for bankers, people, these folks were probably hitting just like Gwen, Gwen is hitting. Okay, so this clustering is another approach that can be used when you get to this high order level of discovery. So I'm trying to get into the tree. I want to go behind door number one, door number two, door number three, door number four. On any given line, I don't want to just stop with the parents or with the grandparents or with the great grandparents or with the great great grandparents. I want to go as back as far as the technology would allow me to go. I want to go all the way back to Africa. I want to go all the way back to England. I want to go all the way back to wherever this DNA is, is, is sourced from. And we have the capability to do that. So, so, so there's goodness in being able to do that. We can break through a few of these brick walls. So, so why would I go into a fight like this? When I can go into the fight like this, bring the army with you, test your cousins, test your aunts, test your uncles, test your siblings. All that DNA is going to help you. Whereas if you're just out there alone in the woods by yourself, with your DNA hunting around, you're going to run into a lot of booby traps. You're going to run into a lot of detours. You're going to hit a lot of things. And so your first cousins give you what I call hemispheric DNA, right? First cousins, that's dad's side. That's that hemisphere. First cousins on your dad's side. First cousins on your mom's side, hemispheric DNA. That's going to give you all the DNA on mom's side, right? Hemispheric DNA. So that's great. Hemispheric DNA. That's you. Sometimes you want to know that answer because, again, we're talking about not 23, but 46. So one of the initial questions you want to get answered is, is it mom's side or dad's side? So sometimes the first cousins can help with that. But 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 I, like I said, I'm trying to get back farther than that. So I, I talk about things called quadrant. DNA. So the quadrant DNA is going to take you a level above the hemispheric DNA. It's just not going to tell you which side. It's going to tell you Gantt or Spears. It's going to get you into the right quadrant. It's going to tell you Bankins or Jordan. So we really want to start figuring out who our second and third and fourth cousins are that are in the game. And, and you can use an Excel file or whatever and come up with these surnames and come up with the cousins that you know that are in the game so that when you see yourself matching them, it's probably a gray hit or maybe it's an Ireland hit or maybe it's a Spears hit or maybe it's a, a Smith or Stevens or Mason or Carter hit. So these various cousins in the game in various places can help you with that. Quadrant cousins, very important. Very important. So like I think I said once before, I don't have too many cousins. I never can have enough cousins. All of these cousins can tie me in in some kind of way through door number one, door number two, door number three, door number four. And that's because I'm trying to get all the way back. I want to go back as far as it will take me. There's questions that we can answer. So um, I, I define myself as an American of triracial descent, primarily African. So why do I define myself in that way? If I, if I look at my ancestry DNA ethnicity results, well, that looks like primarily African to me. It's not saying that the other stuff isn't in there, but I'm predominantly African. And, um, for a number of folks that that came that's route that, that roots come through the slave trade, they'll say a good number of that population, 80% African, 20% European, 75% uh, African, 
25% European, 60, 40. You, you get different breakouts depending on how many things would have gone on, how many generations back. So most of my results from all the different testing companies tell me 80, 20, 80, 20 roughly. Okay. So I'm looking at the long, deep lines across the full span. And, and so how am I getting this DNA and where is it coming from? I know my grandfather, Jerome Carter Jordan, he's got a lot of European DNA in his quadrant. So I'm probably going to get a good number of, of my European DNA from his quadrant. My father looks like he's got a good amount of African there. And my grandmother as well, with, with, again, with some European and some other stuff. Um, but so I want to be able to see the DNA in its totality and then be able to figure out, well, where's this stuff coming from? How am I getting different things? Now, I'll, I'll spend a little time on this one because there's, there's a couple of ways you can test yourself, right? You can use autosomal DNA, which is when you go to 23andMe or Ancestry or Family Tree or MyHeritage, you put your kid in, and it gives you a DNA result that gives you an understanding of all your cousins, all your aunts, all your uncles, everybody going back, gives you some kind of a distribution. If you want to get a specific, very deep answer using DNA, you can go in and with family tree DNA and take the Y DNA test. And the Y DNA test gives you an answer of your father's, 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 father's. I don't want to run off the table. Uh, thousands of years back, thousands of years back on that line takes you back to someplace. OK, so. I can just take the test and get an answer on that deep line uh, result using a Y DNA test. That's just the men can do that. That's Y DNA. Both men and women can take something called a mitochondrial test. And the mitochondrial test will do the mother's, 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 mother's line all the way back to someplace. Well, I can take that test too. Okay, I'm digging in my pocket here, but I can take that test too. So. So I've taken the mitochondrial, I've taken the Y. So I'm in Africa in, in, on the Y line. I'm someplace in Africa on the mitochondrial line for mom and from dad. Well, guess what? I brought my army with me. I only had two rounds in the chamber. So I fired the bullet, I fired the gun twice. I'm out of ammo, but I've got a Banken's cousin. I've got a Banken's cousin that can take a Y DNA test on the Banken's line. And you on that Bankers line, he can go back to Africa on that Bankers line. And when he goes back to Africa on the Bankers line for him, he just went back to Africa on the Bankers line for me, too, because we're cousins. OK, I can go to one of my Jordan cousins and get him to take a Y DNA uh, test on the Jordan slash Barnes line, taking him back to Europe. So that's a Y DNA test to help validate and confirm some of that European DNA that I know is coming out of that Jordan quadrant. Why DNA to help me get there? Um, I've got oral history and some other things that, that you can also use that you don't necessarily, you don't want to take anything off the table. If someone tells you some oral history, oh, where can you prove it? Show me something in a, show me chromosome five, show me where you get the hit, you know? So we've got some discussions about Native American on my, on my father's side through Rebecca uh, Smothers. And my grandmother says Basil Bankins and Camilla Smith has some uh, Native American in them. So I, I, I just went to my DNA results. That was, I was 80, 20. Where, where'd the Native American go? Well, we're gonna hopefully touch on that in a little bit. Okay, so those are the three types of main testing that we can do. Now, one of the tests I just made reference to, why DNA? So you're able to load your DNA and uh, get that result that takes you back thousands of years. I think I said fathers, 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 I almost fell off the table. Fathers, fathers, okay? So you start in the Ethiopian area with, with, uh, with Y, right? What, what do they call them? Um, DNA Adam or however they, however they de describe this guy, you know? And I guess Eve is running around somewhere too. You start where everything started in the beginning. And then the, the, the process takes you back all these years and begins to move you through the migration of that Y haplogroup over time. And using this uh, Y sequence DNA 
process, um, it shows that I'm migrating in this area. And uh, I think the first time I took the family tree DNA test, it gave me a Y haplogroup of EM2. So all that EM2 was saying is that I'm several steps away from the beginning, which is where we all come from, and two or three leaps away from that, my DNA would be found here. So if if they look at the term is called, uh, oh my, um, uh, mutations. These mutations. So over time, the the, the DNA starts to change um, and mutate. And so when these major mutations uh, develop, the scientists can figure out where and in, in time and in place where these mutations are occurring. So all of a sudden we beeline away from EM2 and we start heading, we start heading west. And now my DNA is listed in the most current uh, iteration of what the scientists have figured out who are studying the y Hapler group. They say I'm EZ6005. And this was a, a 23 and me result. So EZ66005, that's where that ends up in the Gambia, Senegal, the area where Kunta Kente comes from. Now, and it's 3,000 years old. So there's something called a big Y. And I haven't done the big Y because that, that's, that's, a, that's a hefty, hefty price tag to do the big Y. And if you want to do the big Y, I could do the big Y and maybe I go from this part of Senegal to that part of Senegal for some ridiculous amount of money. I moved that far. I'm still in Senegal and I spent all that money to get this far on the map. So so at least for now, I haven't spent the money for the big Y. But but suppose I do the big Y and all of a sudden it zigs and it zags. And next, you know, I'm down in Sierra Leone or something. So I haven't done it yet. I don't know what it's going to be if I do do it, if it's going to going to stay consistent with this trend, which seems to be heading towards the coast. But for all intents and purposes right now, I think I found the land of my father's in Senegal. And that's kind of what I'm what I'm playing with on the Y a Hapla group. And so on my on my fan chart, that's why I have not just Africa, but I'm isolating in on my my friend here, which, which we'll talk about in a little bit and specifically Senegal. I think that's where my paternal line is going to end up when it's all said and done. But, um, and, like, and so, so we've talked about some of the other ways that we can get some of the European uh, information. Their data is a lot more full. It's not, it hasn't been torn and ripped to shreds by slavery and a bunch of other stuff. And so in some instances, you can literally just find records that can take you back several generations. Maybe there's a name change or what have you. So even notwithstanding a Y or a mitochondrial result, sometimes you literally might be able to find just actual data in Europe and other places that can help you resolve some of these Europe results. Um, this, French, this French line that I'm getting on my Carter line, that's a result of a mitochondrial test that we took to get that DNA line into Europe, specifically into France. So you want to be, be able to use all of this DNA and all the ways you can use it to kind of make some sense of this. And then there's that, that Native American piece, the piece that so many people struggle with. Um, I, I think I'm going to talk about that later on. So, but, but we still have that on the table. So I'm using a number of tools. And some of you might know some of these tools, and some of you uh, might have some familiarity with them. If you're in this game, if you if you're new to some of this, some of it's pretty rudimentary. We have we have discussions on Zoom. We have we have uh, heavyweights and big hitters, heavy breathers, whatever term you want to use, that sit up to two or three o'clock in the morning mulling over some of this stuff. And a couple of them, are, couple of them are in the room. We would have that better than you, but sit there and say, now let's see what happened here. What happens next? And this is what we do. So we use Zoom. Uh, you can go to YouTube and look at look at a lot of the videos that some of these people are putting out. You can go to Facebook and sometimes you call up your cousin. The cousin doesn't want to give you the time of day. Hey, that's all right. Go to the Facebook page and there's mama and there's daddy and there's the cousin and there's the brother. And you can maybe get enough information 
off the family just at least cr create a, a rudimentary tree on, on Facebook. And then you have the testing companies, you have Google Earth, you have JetMatch. Uh, so these are some of the tools of the trade that we have available in these days, in this time, that maybe weren't even around five, 10, 15 years ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're in an environment, we're in a target rich environment. We've got stuff available to us that people haven't had before. And, and here's, here's the other point I'll make. There's no guarantee this stuff's going to be here two years from now. Uh, you know, some, some, some fat cat might come along and I'm going to buy this thing and make it and put it over here or, or re-wig it, re, you know, re, re, redirect it and make it do something else. So I'm going to, I'm going to come into here and make people pay me thousand dollars to even have access to all this hard work they've done at two o'clock in the morning. All that data that's sitting there, give me a thousand dollars. I'll let you still have access to it. We don't know what's going to happen down the road. So, so I'm saying we didn't have this several years ago. We might not have this several years from now. I'm gonna pause on that for a second. Let that marinate. So for people, oh, well, I, I know you want me to do this. I'll, I'll get back to you. Okay, the clock is ticking. Okay, all right. All right, so, so now we're gonna get into some meat and potatoes. And and some of what I've been talking about before is going to is going to help, I think, uh, add to uh, some of these real nuts and bolts discussions. Philip, Philip Jordan, of course, we're all from St. Mary's County, so everybody goes by the middle name. So he doesn't go by Philip; he goes by his middle name, Myron. But when I go, so. If I say Philip or Myron, talk about the same guy. Philip and I are, are third cousins. He and I share four segments, 52 Santa Morgans. And um, we'll just call this person the tooth doctor. Philip is a fourth cousin match to the tooth doctor. 26 Santa Morgans on two segments. So remember what I said earlier. Okay, where are the segments? Is it maternal or is it paternal? I'm, I'm, okay, Aunt Chester, you, you, you told me something, but okay, I'm trying to figure this out. I'm trying to go back several years. You got to give me more than that. Now, again, they, they'll have the through lines and a few other things that will work you back and show you some of the names that take you back. And what, what their analysis does, and, I, and I'm in agreement with it, is taking us back to a guy named Joseph Mason, 1785. Joseph Mason. So the Masons were here in St. Murray's County. Okay, so... But, but what's interesting here, Myron, he's matching the tooth doctor. I'm not. Okay? I don't have a match. I don't have two segments matching the tooth doctor. My cousin Myron does. But I do match Myron. He's my third cousin. So sometimes, again, this DNA is, is, is wonky. It's wonky. It's... It's, it's, it's spongy, it's smooshy. So I might be matching somebody in common with somebody else and I don't match them, but in common we have somebody and that commonality can take you someplace. So him going through Jeremiah and through Mary and her going through Mary and Daniel and Alex to get to the same place, well, guess what? I just went along for the ride because his Mary Mason is my Mary Mason, so we still get to the same place. It's just that down at this level, she and I didn't have a DNA match. So again, when people talk about, well, you say you match so-and-so, or you say your, grand, your great-grandpappy is, is Joseph Mason, uh, I, I, you, you're not even matching the tooth doctor. How, how do you get to that answer? Well, I didn't have to match. I didn't have to match the tooth doctor. My cousin in my army matched the, matched the tooth doctor. I got there indirectly. So now here's, a, here's another eye chart. Now, um, <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, we're going to explain it. Okay, so I've highlighted this line here. Why? Because we're going from we're going from sibling, the first cousin, the second cousin, the third cousin, all the way down. And uh, if you go to Facebook, there's some Facebook groups that are online, and they really they really kick the tires and go through all kinds of generations uh, on on this stuff. 
to two o'clock in the morning too. Everybody's up to two o'clock in the morning doing this stuff. Um, and so this guy, Mark, has taken some data that uh, Blaine Bettinger has done on his page where he's, he's gotten a bunch of people to throw all of the DNA results into the hopper. Then he stirred it up, put it in the blender, mixed it, and, and, and done some things with it so that he can come up with some no kidding, real, real to life answers on what is a parent's DNA? Well, 34 centimorgans, parent to, to child. What's a, a sibling's DNA? 2,600 2, centimorgans, sibling to sibling. What's a first cousin's DNA on average? 800 to 900 uh, centimorgans on average. And again, there's a range and so forth and so on. So if we come out here to third cousin, this says 73 centimorgans, and, but the range can take you anywhere from zero to two, 234. And like I said, I'm a third cousin match to my cousin, Philip, Philip Myron. He was a 26 centimorgan match to the tooth doctor. So if we make my face go away and imaginary, put Philip in his place, now Philip's there and we're trying to figure out this, this fourth cousin relationship and where this 20 centimorgan hit might come out for him and the tooth doctor. So about fourth cousin, somewhere in that range. So this is a nice chart that you can use to, to play around with that. And, and get some sense, uh, at least get you in the ballpark relating to um, how the DNA might work. So we've got the 26 centimorgans for tooth doctor. We've got the 73 centimorgans for me. And that's, that's great. Now, but I want to know where. So if I can upload that information, get it out of Ancestry, and put it in the Jet Match, right? Now, when Ancestry says, Spears, you got a four-segment match with your cousin, Philip Myron. Well, I can go, well, where? Where is it? Well, you got one on chromosome one. You got two on chromosome 18. You got one on chromosome 22. Here's your four segments. So I know, I know where it is on the chromosome. Because I know Philip Myron is a maternal cousin of mine, I know which side, paternal or maternal. I have that answer. And I, I have the specific address. I can go right to that address to see who else is matching me right there. Who else is matching me right there? If they're matching me on the maternal side, right in these in any of these specific spots, then there's a high probability that I'm looking at somebody that Philip's going to match to as well. Okay. Now the tooth doctor, she's matching two segments, 26 centimorgans, chromosome six and chromosome 11. All right, so here's where we get here's where it gets fun. Um, okay, so chromosome, what do I got here? Okay, so chromosome 11 is where we're going. All right, so this is this is the jet match. This is how you'll see some of the chromosomes in jet match. Okay, and again, I know these are eye charts, and I know if this is unfamiliar, so it's it's rough to look at maybe. But it's telling us a lot of information. It's, it's like reading sheet music. If if you're not a, if you're a musician and, I, and somebody and you're sitting there and, and you're a trumpet player and all of a sudden the guy takes the sheet off and puts a new sheet in front of you, well you you know what you're you're a musician. You can read that sheet music and you okay you probably tried to trick me there didn't you yeah and you just keep going because yes yeah, a bunch of squiggly lines on a chart but you know what you're seeing. You can interpret and appreciate and follow what's going on there. Well in in the genealogy world. We kind of can have an appreciation for this stuff. So, so the yellow means there's a match. And the yellow on the top, the blue on the bottom means there's a match. And there's something called half match and full match. Half match will mean that maybe you're matching just one of the grandparents or just one half of, of, of a, a given situation. A full match would mean you might be matching on both sides of the family at the same time if you were to see a blue on the bottom and a green on top. And sometimes you'll see the interference because again, it's wonky, it's techie stuff. And so, you know, they, 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 don't, they don't come up with a way to just get rid of some of the stuff that gives you some idea that might be some other stuff happening there. But so sometimes when you see the, the, the green splinters in there or the red splinters, it's, it's still, we have a way to just interpret that as being yellow and, and blue and so forth. If you have red on top, and black on the bottom, and again, it's very, it's rarely shown as a very solid red. It's normally shown with the yellow splinters in there, 
But as long as that black line's on the bottom, that's telling you you don't match that person in that area. So that's kind of an explanation of what we're looking at here for the symbology. So, so what we're looking at with, uh, I'm going to go through this. This is, uh, this is the tooth doctor. This is chromosome 6 and chromosome 11. Now look at another advanced application that I can use with, with JetMatch again, where you can say, JetMatch, go out and get, find 10,000 people, put them all on the hopper, and take a look at Philip Myron Jordan and compare him to 10,000 people and tell me who's hitting where. And look at chromosome 11 lighting up like a Christmas tree. All of those people are hitting on that same spot, that same spot of chromosome 11. Now, we know some things about some of these people. Some of these people are GU-272 descendants. Some of these people have Southern Maryland roots, okay? So here and here and here, Mama Sage, these are GU-272 people. So we know those people, okay? Now we start to see these other names. I'm going to find, who are these other folks? So we have to, uh, I'm going to skip through some of the inter, 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 intermittent steps to just tell you, just get to the end and say, we have found out that some of these people that are concluded, included in this are from the other side of the world and down under in Australia. And they're all hitting on the same spot. So we're scratching here. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. We're starting off in St. Indigo's and sometimes we ended up in Australia. How's that happening? What's going on here? So I go to another, another testing company, MyHeritage. They really are heavy on European DNA, much more so than some of the other testing companies. You want to swim in all lakes if you can. So we, we've got our cousin, Philip Myron, in my heritage. And guess what? The Australians are there too. And not only when I went to my heritage, I still I found the same three Australians in my heritage on chromosome 11 in the same spot. We also pick up another cousin that in my heritage that we didn't see on Ancestry. She's from England. Okay, so now the plot thickens. And if you read that, that Blaine Bettinger explanation, he's talking about what a triangulated segment is. It's a segment that gives you some indication that all of these people are mapping back up through time and generation to a common ancestor. So my heritage is saying all of these people are related some kind of way. OK, and that that term is called triangulation. So we're all the way down under in Queensland, Australia hunting these people. And we've got the other match now that we know about in Cornwall, England, in Southern England. This is crazy. Okay. Now, we can literally, sometimes people will tell you, when you start dealing with these ethnicity uh, estimates, if I'm trying to discern um, Benin Togo from Nigeria, if I'm trying to discern France from England or Germany, you know, good luck with that. But if you're trying to discern European from African, if you're trying to dis discern African from Asian or maybe Af or, or Native American, there's enough of a break there where you give these these testing companies enough credit to say, OK, I, th I think I can put some credence in their results at that level. But if they try to get more granular than that, then, you know, you're going to have different people that have different ways of responded to that. So at least at that level, um, I think there's some validity to looking at some of the processes that allow you to see the ethnicity of some people. So we've taken this, this match on chromosome six, and this is, how it, this is how it comes to us when we first see the answer. Chromosome six between 18 million and 33 million megabars, 13.7 centimorgans. Okay, we can see that. So we can put it in another, another program and we can blow it up and expand it so that the 18 million, the 33 million, the way it comes to us truncated here, we can blow it up to 18 million, to 33 million over here, and we can see what that puppy looks like in an enlarged fashion. And so that segment that the Tooth Doctor and Philip Myron Jordan have on chromosome six 
because this is his profile, this is her profile, and this is what Jeb Match is saying. They're both sharing. And we can see there's some European in there. It's a lot of African in there too, okay? So we might say that this segment is kind of an African-leaning piece of DNA. And so that's helpful to know when you're trying to figure this stuff out. So I'm going to jump to this one. Yeah, because now we're on chromosome 11. That's that chromosome we had all those people, to include those Australians and the woman from uh, Cornwall in southern England. So this is Philip Myron and one of the Australians. His, his name is Eddie. We come back to Eddie. Okay, this is chromosome 11 between 100. Uh-oh. Between 100 and 15. Let's see if I can do this. All uh, right. Yeah, is that about it? Okay. Hopefully that's good. Between 115 and 127 megabars, 27, 21 centimorgans. So look what those two have in common. It's a lot of European. So that's telling me the common ancestor on chromosome 11, more than likely it's going to be a European match. So if I lay out, um, if I lay out Philip Myron Jordan's DNA. Now, I already know his line, right? One generation, two, three, four, all the way back to Thomas Francis Jordan and his wife, Mary Mason. The reason why I'm, I'm getting off of his, his paternal line at this stop is because we've already predetermined that the match that Philip has with the tooth doctor and a bunch of other people is, is because of Joseph Mason which is of GU-272 fame. And if you know who Louisa Mahoney was, who was at St. Indigo's uh, and was part of the, the GU-272 thing and the Jesuits were trying to sell uh, a bunch of people to the, the sugar plantations in Louisiana in 1838, and Louisa found out about it and says, I don't think so. I'm going to run in the woods. So she runs in the woods and doesn't get on the ship. As a result of not getting on that ship, she later meets and marries Alex Mason, my Mary Mason's brother. And so next thing you know, they have a family. And all the DNA that we have in this cluster, this GU-272 cluster, is a result of Alex Mason and Mary Mason being brother and sister. So, so I, I may or may not have a direct Mahoney match, but I can, I can conclude my DNA through this union because I know who her husband was. And I know who my great great grandmother was. And so we're on the Mason side now, going the rest of the way. And GU 272 helps us with that. So, so, so that kind of resolves how we got back those six generations with, with Philip. Now I bring up Eddie. Now, Eddie's father, his name is William Johnstone. And his grandfather, was Sidney Penhalligan. If you notice, Sidney Penhalligan's date of death, if you can see that, he was a young man. It says 1915. So if we think about history, what was going on in 1915? World War I. He's killed in action in World War I. And look when William is born, 1914. He has the kid, takes off the war, and doesn't come back. So now his mother, William's mother, is now a young widower with this young infant, and she gets the tragic news that her husband was killed in combat. She later remarries. She marries a man named John Stone. And um, so while he may have been William Penhalligan at birth, once the mother remarried, they either legally or, you know, either formally, informally, some kind of way, he picks up the name of the second husband and he becomes John Stone to the point where Eddie becomes John Stone. So somebody goes, well, okay, I'm trying to figure this out. And I got this guy named John Stone and I don't know what's going on. Well, if we don't know the World War I story. If we don't know the remarriage. If we don't know the name change from Penhalligan to John Stone, we'll be beating ahead head against the wall looking for the wrong stuff. So, and so these are the types of things that can be funnel 
See, uh, that's why we're up to two in the morning trying to figure some of this stuff out, trying to make sense of some of this stuff. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So that 21 Santa Morgan, that 21 Santa Morgan shared match that Philip has with Eddie, what I'm proposing is that we're going to go on the Penn Holligan line. And again, this Europe, the, the Europe uh, centric DNA and, and analysis is very tight. They, they have, they've had historically pretty good record keeping and they can go back all the way back to whoever you want to go. And so we're able to go back on that Penn Holligan line. We leave Australia, which, which, uh, which William comes, William comes to Australia, has his son who then goes into the war and is killed in action. Um, but from here back, they're all in England. And we can come all the way back 300 years to the Thomas Penn Holligan. Okay. And we got that 21 Santa Morgan hit there. So we go back to that eye chart that everyone loved so well the, the last time I pulled it up. <laughs> and this time we really do plop, we really do plop Philip Myron in the middle. And we go out to the 21 Santa Morgan range. So somewhere between fifth, sixth cousin. And now, so what does that mean? That means that that's going to be Philip Myron's fourth or fifth great grandfather. That's where the common match is going to happen. And we're, we're going to go back to the 1700s to get there. So, so this is, this is pretty good, pretty good stuff to do this. And, <clears throat> and so, so, so I know I've got a, I've got a huge cluster of GU 272 people that match, uh, to align our, our common DNA with Joseph Mason. But I also know that this 20, uh, who was, a, who was a mulatto, but I also know this 21 segment, uh, piece of DNA on chromosome 11 is more than likely European DNA. Well, now we've got a name. We've got a timeline. We've even got a suspect. Okay. Because at age 20, at age 25, Thomas Penhalligan has his son, Richard. And then that line comes all the way down to Eddie. But at age 38, and that's off the screen here, but by age 38, we, we, we assume that this Thomas Penhalligan has a child, maybe with an enslaved woman, and that child produces our Joseph Mason. Um, did this happen in England? Did this happen in Africa? Did this happen on the high seas? We may never know any of that. So the DNA could take you only but so far. And then you might be just left with saying everything we have indicates. And this is as far as we've gotten up to this point. That's the best you can do. But this is, a, we've got some strong indication that that's what's happening here. Um, that, that Thomas Penn Holligan is uh, Philip's fifth great grandfather. Um, so let's see. So yeah, we say he's the fifth great grandfather. And um, we're calling this Penn Holligan DNA. So we're making that tentative call 300 year old DNA on chromosome 11, matching Philip from America to Eddie from Australia. So, so how do I know all that I know about these Australians? Well, because there's another guy that stays up to three o'clock in the morning in Australia. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> his, name, his name is John. And, and John has done tremendous research with the whole Penn Holligan family. He's the brother-in-law of Eddie. He's married to one of the one of Eddie's sisters. And of course, there's a 14-hour time difference between here and in, in, in Australia. But I've been trying to get John to do a, a Zoom call. We want we want to try to find a time slot that will work for both ends and get us together to talk more about some of this research. But I know a lot more about the Penn Holligan family because of some of the great research he's been doing on his end coupled with the research that we're doing on our end. Well, well you've got all this stuff about the, the war and the name change and this. I can tell you about Louisa Mahoney and the GU-272 and Joseph Mason and St. Indigo's. 
And so we've got to collaborate. We've got to all come together. We've got to take our history and blend it with their history and come up with the history, right? Because it's all really one history when it's all said and done. Okay, so there's goodness in that. So I'm gonna, so now I'm gonna go to Mother Africa. Okay, so we talked about the hemispheres, right? So I've got my cousin Muhammad. He's on my father's side of the story, right? Then I've got my cousin Lydia and her son Tolerunju. We've got on my mother's side of the of the ledger. So maternal DNA, paternal DNA, Mother Africa. Uh, and we'll, we'll try to wind this down here, take some questions. Okay, so Muhammad, we know he's from Senegal. And one of my cousins has just, just told me, because I wasn't certain about how to pronounce the name of the, the city or the village that he's from. So we'll get to that in a second. And who, who would have thought that it's, it's an interesting pronunciation. So he matches my cousin Butch. He matches my cousin Linda. He matches my cousin Ernest. Now, there's small Cinemorgan matches. So you have some people in the community who say, oh, small Cinemorgan matches. Space dust. Could be, a false, could be a false flag. Could be a false positive. You know, when you get down below 10 Cinemorgans, what, what do you really have? I mean, really? You know? <laughs> but, but if you've got three, four, five people in the game, if I've got Butch hitting this guy, nine Cinemorgans, Linda's hitting this guy, Eight cent of organs. Uh, um, a few others hitting this guy. Now, here comes my ringer. I think my ringer's coming up next. Yeah, there's my ringer. My, my Aunt Helena, I mean, Cousin Helena, Helena Spears. So she's hitting the guy at, at one cent of organ. The interesting thing about Helena, she's a half cousin. Ah, oh, those magical half cousins. So what does that mean? Half cousin is going to tell you um, a whole bunch of stuff. Why? Because all of these folks, Ernest and Linda and Butch, they're all related through John Allen Spears, our great grandfather, as a result of a union he had with Lucille Purvey. Okay. He later in life comes over here to Solid Plantation and marries Mary Scriber. And now he has a whole bunch of kids that are Spears Scriber. Okay. And Mary Helena is a result of John Allen's uh, union with Mary Scriber. So we can use John Allen as, as the uh, indicator and Helena as the indicator as to if that guy from Senegal is matching these people and he's matching her, well, who's the one person that's kind of in the holding the bag for all of that? John Allen with the two, with the two families that he stood up. So a half cousin match can help help discern that and allow you to see that. Uh, and you might be able to get to that kind of an answer other ways. But certainly once you have this happen, it makes it a lot easier to kind of be more comfortable with your with your assertion. So I call this guy in Ancestry. And of course, he's he's a young man. He's not he's not on Ancestry. Who knows why he even took the test? He's 100 percent. He's 89, 96 percent Senegal. What do you what do you put the test in for anyway? It's going to come back. You're 100 percent Senegal. You can what's going to tell you that you don't already know. But thank goodness that he did. But once he did it, he he's moved on to other things. So, hey, man, I'm your cousin. Send me back a note. Wait a few months. We'd really love to talk to you, cousin. Let's see if we can work this out. And wait a few months. And first, I'm getting older. <laughs> So finally, I go to Twitter, hunt around on Twitter. I say, oh, TikTok, Twitter, all the, all the newfangled stuff. <laughs> I go, so I go to Twitter. Hey, are you the same guy on Ancestry? Hey, hey man, that's me. <laughs> so, so for months, I'm beating my head against the wall trying to find this guy in Ancestry. But all I had to do was go where the young people were. <laughs> and he would come right up. So I went to Twitter and he comes right up and I go and I said, well, well, talk to me, cousin. You're a distant match to people. I think you're uh, matching me on my father's side of the family. I got a half cousin. It's John Allen Spears from St. Mary's County. You know, he knows. He, he, OK, you're not telling me anything. But he tells me he's from this this city. Now, we know one person that knows the answer. Anyone else want to take a stab at how to pronounce that? T H I 
E S. Okay, we're getting a lot of that. I'm told it's pronounced chess. Oh, wow. And I guess that's because, of, you know, the French influence. And uh, But I'm told this, this is called chess. And so I'm going to run with that the rest of my life. That's what, that's what that's called. So he's from the city of chess in Senegal. And in, in one of his notes back to me, he says, I'm, I was born in Senegal. My father's people were the emperor. They had a dynasty that went back to 1350. He said, oh, my goodness. You know, I've stumbled into this, this, this Senegal pre prince from Senegal. So if people tell you you're from kings and queens in Africa, I can say, yeah, you want to see a picture? And here's my cousin, Mohammed from Senegal. So, so we talk about mom's side or dad's side, all right? So we already know he's on dad's side because of John Allen. We've got that part figured out. Um, because of John Allen, because of the half cousin, we got that much figured out that Muhammad's going to be linked to us some kind of way on dad's side. But there's also a possibility, right? There's also a possibility. There's a possibility that he could be on this Y line. Did I want to do that? Um, there's a possibility that he could be on the Y line that takes us all the way back past John Allen to his dad to this dad, to this dad, to that M, that, that EM2, and that Z, uh, that whatever I said it was, ZM6005 haplogroup, all the way back to Senegal. And so, um, and, and again, I haven't taken the big Y, and, and I don't know uh, if it's going to do a, a real abrupt, crazy zig or zag, because it did some crazy zigging and zagging over here. So we can't rule that out. But it looks like that thing is heading right for chess in, in Senegal. And so that's what I, this is where I believe my father's line is. OK, so. OK, we'll do we'll do one more real quick. So now we've got Nigeria and my cousin Lydia and the Spears five. So these are small segments and people will say, well, small segments are false segments. They're, they're mostly false rather than being true. Well, I've got five siblings that I can throw in the game. So if I throw, if I get a hit with this, this Nigerian, I go, oh, I wonder if I got something here. Check my other siblings. Oh, my sister's hitting her too. So that just gives you a little bit more confidence that maybe, maybe you don't have space dust here. Maybe you do have a real McCoy here. So um, fortunately, when I, when I contacted Tolerunju, I didn't have to go to Twitter to catch up with him. He answered me on, on, on Ancestry. And he gave me pictures of his family and talked to me about where they were from. He's from Idawani, from the Yoruba tribal region in Nigeria. So this is great having this conversation. It's like a, this is like an Alex Haley Kunta Kente moment. I'm, I'm on the internet talking to this guy from Nigeria. It's great. So we have this triangulated match. I say, Tolerunju, please get your mother out of ancestry. Put her in gen match so I can find the chromosome. I want to find the address. I already know. Yeah, I already know it's maternal. I just need to find the address. So he, he agrees and puts his mother, since he's managing her kit, he puts her in so that I find out his chromosome 16 right at the beginning. And I find other people that are matching her as well that are commonly related to us. So I now know that our Nigerian cousin is on my mother's side on chromosome 16. And there's my Jordan cousin again, that Bankins Jordan cousin that we talked about. And another cousin named Anita, who... Um, I know she's related to us on the Smith side. And, and so I go, well, my grandmother, my great grandmother was Camilla Smith. She was at, Sotoli, at Susquehanna Plantation um, here on the Batuxan River uh, under the Carols. And so I'm thinking that our, our African link is going to be through Camilla Smith on the maternal line. And so just like with, with I did with Muhammad in Senegal, I had at least an earlier possibility that, that along the mitochondrial line, going back thousands of years, I've just discovered my tribal roots on my maternal side, going back to the uh, Idawani Federation in Nigeria. And that could be a great, great new story, a nice happy ending, um, but it, it turns out not to be true. Um, and here's why. We're talking about Southern Maryland. Everybody's related to everybody else. Yeah. Uh, uh, Anita, she is a Smith, but she's also a queen. 
which is GU272. And so, so why I thought the link could more than likely be with Smith comes to find out that it's actually a Carter match. And how do I know that? Remember I said I was going through that painstaking process? It took me over a year to figure out those 46 chromosomes and where the DNA was landing. So re remember, you can see where this is going. Remember that match I had with her is on chromosome 16, right far left. Chromosome 16, chromosome 16, far left. Okay. So we pull up another high speed chart and we start pulling up people. I'm just using, this is another match that I'm using as an example, but you can see Lydia, you can see another uh, Nigerian named Murphy who's matching here. You can see I'm in there. We're all hitting in the same spot on chromosome 16. And so, and, and my sister is in there too. It's Carlin Ford. That's my, that's the sister that we showed earlier. That was also a match to this match. And so I can run some clusters and, and running the cluster with Lydia. I'm getting matches with myself and a guy named Frank and a, and a woman named Rosalind. We're seeing all the same suspects. If I flip it and didn't run the same query with Murphy at the top, we're getting Frank and Rosalind and myself, all the same suspects using clustering on chromosome 16. If I go to the high speed triangulation tool in JetMatch to say, do we have a common ancestor? And what this is showing is that everybody here is matching everybody else here on chromosome 16 at one specific spot between these, these Greek coordinates, if you will, on chromosome 16 and those green dots are all lining up. So we got a match. So when we go to chromosome 16 and we look at it and I pull up my visually phased answer, my answer for chromosome 16, guess what happens? If she was a Smith Bankins match to me, this match wouldn't be here. This match would be over here. It, ha it, ha it would have to align to where I'm getting Bankins DNA. I'm not getting Bankins DNA over there. Grandpa pulled the rope. On that side of the chromosome, for me, on my maternal side, I'm getting, that was close. That's, that's, that's 30 years of army PT, just say me there. Okay, so um, I'm getting Jordan DNA over there, right? Okay, I gotta watch that steak there. That's that's dangerous. Okay, so there you go. I line that up. That part of chromosome 16 is aligned with my grandfather Jerome Carter Jordan. But oh my goodness, it's not Bank and Smith. It's Jordan. And visual phasing helped me to get that answer. And this is this is my footprint. This is this is my snapshot on chromosome 16 that I have that now I can use and apply in real world cases to dig deep into some of these uh, queries and questions. So now I'm not gonna go behind door number four looking for Bankins and Smith DNA as relates to the Nigerian. I'm gonna, go pay, I'm gonna go to door number three to Mason and Jordan and Carter to look for the DNA match if I can ever find it. And I may not ever get any closer than this, but I know I gotta go past door number three to find this cousin because of visual phasing. And to put the icing on the cake, uh, icing on the cake, got to put any icing on the cake slide. I actually got to talk to him and meet him, even though it was virtually through a Zoom call, we had a chance to talk face to face. And this was truly a Kota Kente moment, having this, this, this Zoom call with my cousin Tolerunju from Nigeria. So we're trying to bridge the gap that enslavement caused. We're using DNA to do that. The one last thing I will say, well, maybe not the last thing. Um, <laughs> we still love you, Jerome. Okay. Love <laughs> I talked about the Native American, that, 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 that so elusive Native American piece. Oh, you got high cheekbones and hair down your back and oh, you're a Native American. Okay, and everyone has their, their own take on this. I've got a cousin in Connecticut. As we speak, he is on the line. He's a male on the line. He directly descends from a U.S. colored troop 
name uh, Julius Smith from St. Mary's County. And beyond him is Frank Smith, my great, great, great grandfather. If I can get this guy to take this Y DNA test and it comes back with a O or a Q haplogroup, which would be, if I'm, if I'm getting the letters correct, that would be a Native American link. That would then link that, that oral history that we have about Frank Smith being, his father being a, a, a Native American. And I can come up with a science-based to find why haplogroup result to get that answer. Uh, unfortunately, for two years, I've been trying to get this guy to answer the phone. Two years. And I'm a DNA match to his sister. So I already have an autosomal link to this guy. And so I've been talking to the, I've been trying to talk to the sister, crickets. I've been trying to talk to the guy, crickets. I found the sister's daughter, crickets, crickets. So I, I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to resolve more closely than when I have this, this Native American line. Um, but you get the idea that we can go deep on some of these lines. We can discover, if we collaborate, if we talk, if we, if we use our network, if we get everybody in the game, right? So it's just not me alone as a standalone. I've got the whole army in there. So if my DNA doesn't work, maybe my cousins or my sisters or my brothers will. And then you get on the phone or you get on Zoom and you call a guy in Australia or you, you do what you need to do to get more information that you don't have. So you're filling in his gaps, he's filling in your gaps. And collectively, we can we can make a difference. We can use this technology. We can go around the world. We can solve things that have never been solvable before using DNA as our as our process to do that. And so, yes, there's, there's certainly a cornerstone of discovery entailed in what we're trying to do. And with that, I will stop, take a drink of water and answer any questions. Wow. Now, he spoke to my biology geek heart. I just loved everything. You're the kind of professor I, everybody needed for science. Um, I know we'll have some questions. Eve, uh, let me know if we have any online. She's going to be monitoring the chat. If you have any questions, I'm going to come around and bring the mic to you so that you can speak directly into it. We can all hear. Does anybody have any questions? So I know my family thinks this is a crock of, and no one has really done the DNA testing. Thus, I would have a blank screen, correct? So I've, I have to convince brothers, cousins, et cetera, to do DNA test or I find zero. No, you will find, you will find what your DNA on its own will allow you to find, but you'll be able to find a lot more if you got your siblings involved to help you and cousins and aunts and uncles, parents that are still around, the more the merrier, the more the better. Are the problems with the DNA is because of all of the outside things that people think are going to get done with their DNA? Yes. You know, police, whatever. Yes. So that's it, really the stoppage of why people aren't doing some these people. DNA testing. So, so what my charge is to compel you with going back and resolving 300 year old Penhalic and DNA or having a face to face zoom phone call with my Yoruba tribal cousin Tolerunju to say, okay, there's some, there's some 400 pound Russian out there that might try to be hacking you or doing crazy things with all this information. And so you do, that's why some people don't put the names in. They'll just put initials or they'll use a pseudo name. They do things to try to murk, make the data a little bit more murky uh, because they, they're they a little bit cautious in some of those areas. And so they're not going to say, my name is Joe, Joe Smith, and here I am, and here's my DNA. They'll say, I'm JS, and here's my DNA. And then they'll tell the friends, on oh, Ancestry, I'm JS. Look me up. You know, so there's ways maybe you can still, even with the uncomfort uncomfortableness of this, you can still, if you really want to help, if you really want to find some of these deep answers, uh, anonymize your name, but still put your data in and just tell people how, what your what your pseudo name is in the, in the environment and try to move forward that way. So that's kind of one nugget of advice I think I can offer in that regard. 
Somebody over here, I thought it was you, Dante, just a second. All right, so yes, I'm cousin Dante that Jerome said stays up till three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> um, but um, he hit on a few points, but J Jerome, awesome, awesome presentation as always. I want you to expand more, and you touched on it a little bit, of the importance of what the DNA detective work can do but how very vital it is for the traditional documentation research coupled with knowing the historical uh, aspect of history. You touched on a little bit, and, and I think that that's key um, in your presentation. Trail and all the other that that we might want to call grunt work or, or, or just roll up your sleeves type work, investigating, going into archives, go, going into land records, going into uh, probate records, you know, doing all that, that, that the heavy lifting to find out all that stuff. You find that and now you marry that up with somebody that's got their sleeves rolled up in the chromosomes and figuring out half match from full match and and triangulation and what was the term we said uh, uh, recombination. and recombination and all that stuff, you know, somebody that's rolled up the sleeves and, 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 and you know, engulfed in that kind of thing. And then then I'm telling the guy that's into the paper trail wh what I know. And he said, yeah, well, you know, but they moved. They went across the, the, the uh, Appalachians in, uh, in 1755 and moved to Kentucky. Oh, my goodness. I didn't know that. So now you, you, you bring that together. So the collaboration is is you know and everybody can't be everywhere simultaneously and if i'm up to two o'clock in the morning you know with with two picks in my eyelids fighting through these chromosomes <laughs> i'm not likely to also be you know with with my with my third eye trying to dig through a whole bunch of probate wreckage you know reading this scribbling and, and trying to squint is that that a j or a g i can't make it out you know but somebody else might be that might be their daily wick to get into that area more heavily. And so to the extent that they bleed over into what I'm doing heavily, and to the extent that I have some appreciation and understanding of what they're doing and, and, and can kind of pair off of what they're doing in that area, then all of a sudden we're collaborating, we're working as a team, and we're finding out more talking back and forth to each other than we would ever find out than me staying in my silo and him staying in his. Does that touch on the point a little bit? Study buddies. Um, where, where are you, Dana? Uh, yesterday, she was asking what she could do, and one of the things you were tell well, mentioned to her is get with people who are like minded. What he's talking about is that we have a Thursday night study group. These guys are up until two in the morning. Midnight is my limit. <laughs> Come on, <Clarissa>. but, <laughs> but we actually talk about this and. As they said, there are different people researching different things and we share our trees and we actually share information across lines. So you don't have to do it all by yourself. Good point, very good point. Did you have anything else? Now, uh, to ex expand on that more, um, and I think the two ladies that, that talked mm -hmm. first, I think it's fear of the unknown. Um, and, and so I'm a traditional research person. I love history and I've married those two together. What cousin Jerome does and does so well is he takes that and then looks at the science that blows all of our minds in this room. It truly does. But I think it's the fear of the unknown because what DNA testing has introduced is it has also proved those things that we did not know. 
it's also a lot of people think that it's, oh, DNA testing, they're, it's wrong. They're doing something with my stuff. We get blood for blood tests. We get blood before surgery. We get blood on an annual basis to, to see where our numbers are, cholesterol levels, diabetic levels, creatine levels, everything. So they're all, they already have your DNA. I think it's the fear of the unknown because this is a whole nother animal. We've gone from traditional birth certificates, death certificates, wills, land patents, uh, deed records, to now we've, we've graduated and brought that up to now we can actually definitively prove what paper trails have said and or find out what was not documented in a paper trail or misrepresented right, wrong, or indifferent. None of us can change the past. However, what we can do from this day forward is to make sure our children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, future generations don't have to stay up to three o'clock in the morning like cousin Jerome was talking about, that cousin of ours, um, or, or you know, be afraid to branch out and, tr and trust the science to do exactly what it's always done even if we don't understand it. But if we connect with one that does understand it, if we get that study buddy, and if we become the representatives in our family to say, hey, this is what I'm trying to do for all of us. And I want you to join on board. It, it, it's, a, it's a powerful tool. And, and get you a cousin Jerome. <laughs> we all wish we had a cousin Jerome. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Oh, um, back to you, Jan, just a minute. Eve, in the back online. This is from Angela Wilson Turnbull. Yeah. On all four sides of my family took the National Geographic Genotest, Test, and it showed Ethiopia and Mozambique. And they ask what to do next, please. And then she follows up, has there been some analysis on best privacy practices and settings of particular DNA companies? Um, well, those are, those are big questions. Um, with regard to the, the results that you're getting in Mozambique, and I, if you're getting those answers, um, <clears throat> I, I, would, I would hope that that's a result of you not only getting that answer in your, uh, singularly, but that you've gotten, or that if you could, I would try to get your siblings, if you have siblings, or your, near, your close cousins, and, and let them do some similar testing. And again, you have to go in your pocket a little bit. Who knows? Maybe some of those folks have already tested. And so it's not a matter of them having to pay for the test, but maybe just make you aware of a test that they've already done. So just collaborate more with your immediate family to see if there's any other hits that are similar to that, that are already in existence. And if they're not, and you can garner enough interest and people wanting to try to figure out how far back we can go and where it will take us, then you go out and you wait for a nice Mother's Day sale or Fourth of July sale, you know, because these sales come throughout the year. You wait for the prices to go down a little bit and then get three or four kits when they're on the sale. And then you run out and give them to anybody that you I want your tests in the sample. And, I'm, and you only have to pay for it because I got the test on sale and I want you to take the kit. <laughs> right. So get other people involved. And, and the second part was the, I'm sorry, the second part was. Oh, the privacy thing. Um, with regard to that, again, you can automate, you can anonymize your name. Um, um, that's certainly one thing that I think that you can do. What that does, you know, what that does for me, when I just see two initials or some, some, you know, some cute handle, you know, like the truckers used to have, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm whatever, you know, some trucker handle. Okay. If you're a Johnson or a Smith or a Barnes or a Bisco or a Brisco or a Green, you know, it would make my life a lot easier if it said Green or Bisco or Barber, as opposed to me having to figure out who JT is. But you know, we can we can still get there. It, it would take a little bit more effort to figure out who JT is. But maybe if you you put yourself in anonymously and then you contact some of the immediate people that you know are also working on your line to say, if you see GT and Jet Match, that's me. You know, I'm anonymous, but I'm in the game. And then maybe you can, so that you can get the best of both worlds, perhaps. And then there's another thing you can do. Uh, some people are also a little bit uh, concerned, at least as it relates to putting the data in Jet Match, because 
People know about the Golden Golden Gate uh, strangler or stabber or murderer or whoever he was that they used DNA to catch and and which from my perspective that's a good news story. You get a killer off the street, but there's other people that say, but hey, but how else are you going to use this DNA? We don't want the police running around being able to go into these databases and get my cousin Charlie because you see you see his DNA on the crime scene of this or that. So you can go into JetMatch and opt out of your DNA being available for police related investigations. It's just being used if you hit the button and opt out, just being used for genealogical research. So that's a great feature that JetMatch has put into the system. Again, to give you a little bit more comfort in terms of stepping into the water and, and trying to use some of these tools that I would contend will not be here at the cost and the availability that they're here right now. And people just think, oh, I got plenty of time. Six months from now, this stuff could be so different than what it is right now. And then you'll, you'll, be, you'll be killing yourself because oh, I could have got that kit for this amount and tested all these people. And now they've put a new widget in where you got to do this or you got to do that. So we don't know how the, the landscape is going to change, how the how the game is going to change. Um, so if you're really interested in, in trying to resolve some of your questions, going back six, seven, eight generations possibly, the window to do that perhaps is now greater than this ever been. Okay. So I wondered, I don't watch the program, but I know of the show that Henry Louis Gates does. Mm -hmm. Do you know, does he do something comparable to what you do for his program? He's got such a staff. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. But I'm curious if he uses those I mean, same. He's, when, he, when, he, when he does those things, we went back to, yeah. we went back to the control killer and found the, 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 the ship that got sunk in the, the Gulf. I mean, he's got 100 people. Right. And he just puts on his suit, gets himself looking, and says, okay, what do you got for me today, Charlie? Okay. And they put that big book in front of him and he, he does what he does. Right. So I, I'm sure he has done his own level of research, perhaps in his own immediate family and so forth. But once you get to that level, I mean, you, you got a, you got a production crew working with you, you know, right. but I wonder, you. do they use the same tools you used? I don't know if he talks about that in his show or how he, I, I don't know he? if I've ever seen him talk about jet match per se. They don't, they don't get into the specifics like Norm does, but they do. And there's instances on um, some of the recent shows just this year uh -huh. where they talked about the DNA mapping um, and the genotyping um, <laughs> that could introduce them or connect them mm -hmm. to a place or another group of people. So they do what they, what we see is the showmanship. Sure. Yeah, we yeah. see the showmanship and then they got to sit it down into that hour right. with the, the folks that they're trying to, yeah. you know, Share their story. Sure. Yeah. I've been curious about that show. Yeah. And one last question. You know, if somebody doesn't have the stamina that you do to do what you do, can are there people that you can hire to dig into this for you? I'm I'm told there are. I'm told there are. And and at least from my, from my own perspective though, um and these St. Mary's County these Southern Maryland families are challenging. And if I were to spend 10 minutes, trying, yeah, well, I got my, my, my folks are from here. My folks are from there. You got 10 minutes. First of all, it wouldn't take 10 minutes. But even if I had 10 minutes, that's 10 minutes. I could be trying to find my Nigerian. Or 10 minutes, I could be trying to find the guy in Senegal. Or 10 minutes, I could be trying to get my guy, John, 14 hours away from me in Australia on the phone and see if he, what else he's figured out. So I, I, I'm really trying to make my, my use, my uh, leg around the track with the stick uh, before I hand the baton to someone who I look over my shoulder all the time to say, where's my relief? And all I see is open sky. But hopefully someone will, will, will get bitten by the bug and want to do this. But I'm trying to get as far down the road as I can on all of these lines. And that's why I go from Senegal to Nigeria to, to Australia to France to everywhere in between. I'm looking at all 16 of those lines. And so many people might look at one line or two lines or four lines. I'm, I'm looking at 16 lines. And so in looking at those lines, um, while I know there's people out who do this for hire, I don't know where they find the time, depending on even what they're doing, to then 
carve out enough space to give justice to, right. trying to learn the genealogy of somebody else's situation and then start incrementally working your way back and going through all the records and all the chromosome. And the, I don't know how they would do it. I wouldn't sleep at all if I tried to do something like that. Am I sleeping now as it is, but anyway. And you're still nimble. Um, I think we have time for one more and we do have another online. Is that correct, Eve? Yes, but this is probably more for you, Nancy. It says, oh, is the presentation you. and a recording of this session available to share? Oh, absolutely. So, so everybody who's online, yes, you are going to be able to watch all of the sessions from all of this weekend. So they're all going to be available. Just give us a little time to get them uploaded on YouTube. So while well, that was easy, does anybody have another question? <laughs> we probably have time for one more if there is one. Anybody have something? Well, let me offer one more comment. So a few years ago, I guess it was 2019, I came to St. Mary's County for a pretty big event and everybody was here celebrating. We had a big gathering here at, on, at Southerly. And I, I met these two, these two gentlemen that some of you may know. And uh, doing, doing this a side commentary, you know, I explained to them that my, my great, great grandfather was, was Basil Bankins, who was down the road from here on, um, um, uh, on Rosedale Manor, and uh, that that you know, with with your family being just up the river, what do you guys know about uh, Frank Neal and the people that were down the road on Rosedale? And he says, you know, I don't don't know much about that, but we we've got a few family members. I think I was talking to the the, the brother is John. I think it was John that was doing most of the talking. He says, yeah, but you know, we've done some things here and there. I'll look around and see what we can find. I, I go home, I come back to Howard County and I'm sitting home and, and I think I get an email. It's, it's uh, a gentleman that says, we've got some footage of uh, where some of your folks are being mentioned, but it was throwaway footage. It wasn't even being used for the TV show that, that was being filmed at the time. But uh, I'll send it to you if you think you might wanna, you might wanna make use of it. Oh, sure, send it to me, huh? great. And so he, he sends me the footage and you know you read through all the narrative, and and Judge Briscoe was on the lawn talking to Agnes King Callum, and at one point when you know they weren't rolling, he looks at her and he goes, "Well, you know, I I had a good friend. His name was my father had a good friend. His name was Leonard Bankins. I'm sure you know him." I go, "Leonard Bankins, that's my uncle Leonard. For crying out loud, that's my uncle Leonard from Sodley Road." So I, I I got to see that. The Briscoes at Sodderley and the Bankins at Rosedale, there was some, there was some kind of connection. There was some kind of at least one side known of the other side because of that throwaway comment that was listed in that, in that, uh, in that footage uh, from that day. So, uh, and then, and then the the cousin whose name also slips me, Walter. Walter. The Walter, of course, was running around filming the whole day, and he says, "Oh, you might want to see some pictures of the, the event." He, so he sends me a hundred pictures, which I love. And and one of the pictures was the three of us sitting together. And I thought about the the, the the I have a dream, Dr. Martin Luther King saying, one day we're going to stand at the table of brotherhood. I think he said sit at the table, but I kind of tweaked it a little bit. Stand at the table of brotherhood and figure some of this stuff out together. So so that's what I'm thinking we need to do. And because I had this flag on my shoulder for 30 years in the Army, and I think we can do this, folks. We just have to put our heads together and try. So I'm going to stop here and... There's no way for me to wrap it up better than that. You know, I, he, you've not only hopefully gotten some people inspired, um, daunting, but inspired. I mean, the, the things you've found out and you've taken it to personal connections with new people that you never would have found otherwise. And I think it's just, there are so many of us in this room that already know they're connected, but there are many connections we will have that we don't even know about. And as we're trying to, to, build a, a better world together. This is you know, our dream that we all have. When we find our commonality, that, that is a basis for doing so much of it. And thank you so much again. Another round of applause, guys. Jerome is amazing. Oh my gosh. So for those joining us online, we're gonna go offline for a while. You'll be able to log back in for our next go round. So thank you for joining us. There's gonna be a survey. We do want everybody to take the survey. We really, really want comments on the entire weekend. It's so important to us 
to tweak, to move forward, to, to do everything that we need to do. If you ordered lunches, go see Kim in the back. She will go, and we also have other munchies. So if you didn't, you can still eat and still have fun. So thank you so much. We will be back in an hour at one o'clock. And if you'd like to take a lunch or, or just go sit outside, we've got some benches outside. It's gorgeous out there. So wherever you want to be, hang around here. We'll see you in a little bit.